Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we are going to be talking about how to fly a Boeing 737 when it is absolutely empty. What kind of different procedures do we, the pilots, have to think about? And is there any handling difficulties? Stay tuned. Right guys, so at the moment um, I am still stuck on the ground. Um, I've been sitting for one and a half month now, hence the inoperative t-shirt. And so are hundreds, if not thousands of pilots all over the world. It is an unprecedented time in the airline industry. And as the passengers start drying up, pilots will find themselves flying with less and less passengers on board. Now, if you find yourself in an airline that has actually grounded their entire fleet, well then you might find yourself flying what we call technical or ferry flights. These are flights that are flown without passengers or cabin crew on board. Um, in normal circumstances we do those kind of flights when we for example have to position one aircraft from one airport to another. It might be because they're going in for maintenance or it might be because an aircraft is needed somewhere because one aircraft has gone tech. For whatever reason, you might find yourself doing one of these uh, ferry flights. Now, what you have to understand when you're doing a ferry flight like this, especially without cabin crew, is that there are some threats associated with it and the aircraft will not handle the way that you think it will. So for example, if I have been rostered to do a ferry flight, when I come in to do the, uh, the briefing, I will do the pre-flight work just as normal, because you still have to look for the weather, the no times, en route weather, all of that is exactly standard. But also, there is going to be a specific ferry flight brief that I have to go through with my first officer. And that is because of all of the threats that I'm soon about to explain to you. Then we will head out to the aircraft, uh, we will open it up as normal, the pilot flying will go in and start setting up the um, uh, the cockpit just as normal. The pilot monitoring will go out and do the walk around. Okay, but after the walk around is finished, the pilot monitoring will continue to do a couple of things which we not, don't normally do. Uh, we have to go and we have to check the galleys and secure the galleys. So you go to the back of the aircraft and you make sure that all of the trolleys, you know, where you normally have the catering for the passengers, are locked and that the brakes are set on them. Okay. There are little flaps that you put down to make sure that they cannot move and there are uh, like little breaks that you, that you set. This has to be done because if you don't, if you forget about this step, normally when the catering company comes and puts the trolleys in, uh, they will not lock them. Okay. They will be free to move so that the cabin crew can do their pre-flight checks and check that everything is okay inside of them. Um, we also have to do a general security check to make sure that nothing has been put in there, just like the cabin crew would do. But anyway, the importance of actually locking them into the position is huge. Because you can imagine, if we forget to do that, and then we get into the cockpit, we close the door, and one of these galley carts becomes loose during the taxi out, as we are braking, for example, or when we're starting to descend, this galley car can actually start rolling down the middle aisle and this has happened okay they've been rolling down the middle aisle gaining speed and then slamming straight into the cockpit door and that's the good scenario if the pilots then have decided contradictory to what the normal procedures are to keep the door open because hey there's no passengers on board well then that galley car can come straight through the door and straight into the center pedestal and cause some real damage so this is why it's so important to read through that brief about ferry flights properly. Once the galleys have been verified to be safe and secure, we have to check the toilets as well to make sure that no one has stored themselves away in the toilet. Um, and crucially, the forward left and right door, which we call L1 and L2, uh, needs to be armed. And that's because these doors are the normal escape routes in case we would have to evacuate the aircraft. Obviously, the back doors are not going to be used by anyone, but the forward two doors need to be armed. So the um, pilot monitoring, make sure the doors are closed, then we would arm the, uh, the escape slides and then put the little 
yellow strap or orange strap across the window. It's important that you remember to do that because if there would be a fire or whatever, the firefighters need to know outside the door that that door is armed. Otherwise, they could be really, really hurt if they had to open the door. Right? So this is not something that we would normally do. So take your time doing it if you find yourself rusted for something like this. Then, once this is done, you go in, you close the cockpit door as per normal procedures. There's no changes here. And that is because if you don't, anytime that you do something out of the ordinary, there might have consequences that you haven't thought about. Like, for example, that trolley incident. So close the door and then it's just normal procedures. So pushing back, starting up the aircraft is completely normal. Now, when it comes to setting up the CDU, I should mention that in the case of an empty flight, you are so much lighter than you normally are. Uh, are used to. So on a normal takeoff the aircraft will weigh anything from 58 to 65 even 70 tons. But in this occasion you will have less fuel because you're, em because you're empty and light, no passengers, no cargo. So um, you have to check the weight and balance very carefully to make sure that you're within the weight and balance limits. Now that might sound weird when you're empty but actually being empty is not the norm for the aircraft, so just make sure that you are within the weight and balance limits. Uh, and then, when it comes to setting up the, the thrust, you're gonna have to derate the aircraft as much as possible. And that is because if you don't, the aircraft will have full thrust, and with full thrust and only 42, 43 tons, which is the empty weight of the aircraft, well, you're probably gonna be around 50, 46 tons or something, um, it will climb at an enormous climb rate and you're gonna have a very unusual attitude after departure. So we fully derate the aircraft to use as little thrust as possible and on an empty aircraft that's gonna be around 82, 83% takeoff thrust. What well, we would normally have maybe 92, 93%, right? Then we push back, we start up the aircraft as normal and we start taxiing out. Now, during the taxi out, you will start to notice the first differences here and that is that the aircraft when it's this light will stand very high on its dampers all right the gear struts is going to be almost fully extended because it's used to being 15 tons heavier and what that will cause is that you'll feel that the aircraft is much more shaky it will feel like you're out driving on a potato farm or a you know a gravel road somewhere so it's much softer when it has a lot of passengers on board and it's much harder when you're taxiing when it's almost empty. Also, if you're taxiing on a 737-800, it's fairly okay. But if you start taxiing on a MAX or a Air 320 Neo, for example, those big engines are actually way too powerful to be taxiing the aircraft when it is empty. So you'll find yourself that even with the thrust down to idle, the aircraft will start accelerating on the taxiway, so you're gonna to have to break it down at regular intervals. Apart from that, all of the normal checklist procedures are all the same, even though it will feel weird, you're not gonna get a cabin secure from the cabin, for example, it is still exactly the same type of procedures. And it is important that even though it feels weird, that you keep doing it the way that you've been taught. Anytime you start stepping away from the procedures because, hey, no one is watching you, you are going to start making mistakes. So don't fall into that trap. Now, when it comes to the takeoff, uh, the takeoff roll is exactly the same. You put the engines up to 40%, you stabilize, you press the toga, the aircraft will start accelerating. But obviously, since you're this light, the speeds are going to be lower. So while we would normally rotate maybe at 140, 145 knots, here you're probably going to be rotating around 120 knots. Um, doesn't matter. Rotation, two and a half degrees per second, same but once you have gotten off the ground you'll start to notice that the aircraft will start pitching up to a much higher attitude than what you're used to this is what we talked about before this is why you want to derate the engines because we shouldn't pitch over 20 degrees nose up under any circumstance but if you haven't derated when the aircraft is very light you'll find that the flight directors will tell you to to um, pitch up to maybe 25 degrees now this is closing on into an unusual attitude which is not something that you want to be in after takeoff. So you keep the, the pitch at around 20 degrees, even if the flight directors are telling you to pitch higher. Now this will mean that the aircraft will accelerate. Not really an issue, all right? You're gonna be at so low speeds anyway that you're never gonna be close to overspeeding the flaps, but it's gonna feel different and it's gonna look different. Then we start retracting the flaps. 
flaps are up with normal climb um, procedures as always. However, what you have to be aware of is that the aircraft is going to have an extreme climb rate once you let it climb. Um, so if the climb reduction, as in the, the normally the engines have a little bit of a reduced climb thrust set with these kind of D rates, but as you go above 15,000 feet, that reduction will automatically disappear and you'll get full climb thrust. This means that the aircraft can climb easily at 5,000 feet per minute. Right. Not a problem. And that's not really an issue if you have a long climb clearance. So if you are at 10,000 feet and they clear you to 30,000 feet, not an issue. However, as you start getting closer to 30,000 feet, it can become an issue. And that's because the way that the transponders and the TCAS system works. So TCAS system works by your transponder in your aircraft talking to other transponders in other aircraft. And let's say that you've been cleared to 30,000 feet because there's another aircraft at 31,000 feet. If you are climbing like a crazy person at 5,000 feet per minute, these transponders are going to start talking to each other. And it doesn't matter that you have maybe 3,000 feet to go. If they feel that you are closing in too quickly, it will still issue a resolution advisory for the aircraft above you. So they are going to get a climb, climb, climb issued. You don't want that. All right? And this is why we have rules for this. So what we say is that if you are climbing with a very high climb rate, when there's 3,000 feet to your cleared level, you need to be at 3,000 feet per minute or less. 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet per minute or less. 1,000 feet, 1,000 feet per minute or less. And if you follow that, and you are a little bit, you need to be a little bit ahead here, so at 4,000 feet, you should probably engage vertical speed and start getting your nose down, get the thrust off, well, then there's no problem. You won't cause any resolution advisories. But if you forget this, you could put yourself and the other aircraft into some serious trouble, right? So then you keep climbing up to your cruising altitude. With this kind of weight, your cruising altitude is going to be as high as you possibly can. So in the 737-800, that means 41,000 feet. Climb up to 41,000 feet and we start doing our cruise procedures, which is the same kind of paperwork, the same kind of ATC communication as we would normally do. But there is some extra things. So for example, Every hour, if you're doing a long flight, every hour the pilot monitoring has to get out of the seat and go out and do what we call a fire check. It means that you go through the cabin all the way back to the uh, back galleys and you look to make sure that there's no smoke or anything coming out. The reason for this is that during normal circumstances, obviously, the cabin crew will keep track of this. And if they see any sign of a smoke, it might be because of a short circuit in a lamp or something in the galleys, well, then they would call us and we would start dealing with it. But in this case, there is no one in the back and there is no firefighting in the back. Okay, So if something happens, we won't know about it until we have smoke coming into the cockpit. And we don't want that. So every hour, the, the uh, pilot monitoring will go back, just go through the cabin, make sure everything looks okay um, to make sure that doesn't happen. And it is a very strange feeling. Right. To go through a completely empty airliner when you're at cruising altitude is an eerie feeling. It's also kind of cool. Then anything that you want from the galleys, you're going to have to do yourself. That means if you want a cup of coffee, you're going to have to switch on the boiler yourself, which you also have to remember to switch off later on. And same kind of rules apply. If you're going to take fluids into the cockpit, you need to put them into a screw-on cups um, so that there's no risk of spilling inside of the cockpit. Get into the cockpit close the cockpit door, and that's it. Now for descent planning, not really an issue. Uh, it's actually easier to descend an aircraft that is lighter than normal because you don't have as much potential energy as you would have. At heavier aircraft at a higher speed at that altitude would have more energy than a lighter aircraft. So from a descent planning point of view, not an issue. And if you get shortcuts during your descent, also less of an issue. You will be, it will be easier for you to decelerate and to get yourself back on the profile in a light, empty aircraft than it is on a normal aircraft. Okay. So then as you start descending in towards your approach, same kind of approach briefings and everything, uh, you, won't, you won't notice much of a difference except for the speeds as you're starting to, to extend. Flaps are going to be much lower than what you're used to. They're going to look a little bit weird on your primary flight display, but 
Apart from that, nothing really. The real difference will come when you disconnect, okay? Because an, uh, an aircraft that is flying at a lower speed, especially with the landing flap set, so flaps 30 most likely, or flaps 40, it's gonna fly so much slower that there's less air over the control surfaces. Control surfaces is going to react less than what you're used to. So basically, even though you're nowhere cl close to uh, stall speed, it's just gonna feel mushy, right? It doesn't handle as well as an aircraft that has the weight that it has been designed to fly. Generally though, not really an issue. Now, if once you have disconnected, if you find yourself then having to do a go around, now here's something you need to be really careful with, because if you're flying manually, you press toga, you're not gonna have the auto throttle setting the thrust for you. Um, so pilot monitoring is gonna have to set thrust. Now you're gonna have the full go around indicators on your N1 display. But if you set full go around thrust on an aircraft that is empty, it's going to climb with such a high climb rate that you might bust your missed approach altitude. You might fly through it and fly up above it. Or you might find yourself leveling off quickly, not getting the thrust off quickly enough and having a flap over speed because of it. So here, in case you're the pilot monitoring and you do a go around, set about maybe 90% thrust maximum because that's going to slow the, uh, the go around down a little bit and you're less likely to bust through any altitudes, right? And when it comes to the landing, the landing is more or less exactly the same, but in a normal landing when you have 60 tons maybe on landing, um, you are going to have quite a lot of inertia bring you down towards the ground. Now that inertia is not gonna be there in the same way here. So if you do a normal flare, there is more likelihood that you are going to overflare the aircraft, maybe even start to climb or at least continue to fly. So here you have to be a little bit more careful when it comes to your flare. Having said that, if you would end up overflaring a little bit and landing a little bit longer down the runway than you're used to, not really that much of an issue because the braking distance, the landing distance of an empty 737 is very short, right? You'll notice that you can break it down really, really quickly because the energy is not that high. And then once you've landed, taxi back into gate, everything's done, shut the aircraft down. But then remember that you have armed the slides, okay? So do not just get out of the cockpit and try to open the door, because if you do, you might actually blow the slide. Once again, careful. You should really be two of you, but if it's just one of you, do one um, door at a time and then cross-check carefully that both of the doors have been properly disarmed, that you've removed the little flap across the window before you open the door, all right? Once again, you have a checklist for this, use the checklist. And after that, it's just stroll out, you're done with the day. Right guys, that's what I had about flying an empty aircraft. If you have more questions about this, as always, put them in in the comments below. I hope that I have earned a subscription. So if you like this and you haven't subscribed already, do so and put the little notification bell on so that you're notified when I do live streams or extra videos. Um, and now, have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are. Take care of yourself, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.